That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I but, really enjoyed it because I read a, I read a subreddit recently on Ruben Report on how he's uh, stagnating because he's kind of falling towards an ideological spectrum. He started off very centered and he's falling. And I see that too. Um, it's also been a little disappointing for me too, so we can briefly brush upon that, obviously, at some point. Yeah, and in fact, we are we are now live, and um, so welcome everyone. So sorry for uh, the late notice. Uh, this was kind of off the cuff. We just decided that we were going to have a chat right away because we've been trying to have the secular brownie back for a little while, and he's just been very busy. And then obviously, we've we've had a lot of things on our plate as well. And uh, so I just jumped at the chance to just have him on when he suggested the topic, which, of course, is uh, how do you criticize feminism without being an anti-feminist? So what's the difference between being a feminist and criticizing it or being a non-feminist and criticizing it and being an anti-feminist, like a full-blown yeah. against feminism kind of person? So I think that's a very interesting topic. And uh, it, it's a topic that we obviously have a vested interest in and uh, enjoy discussing. So... Uh, yeah, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, first, uh, Russian Deadpool, or as another video would call you, socially awkward Deadpool. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's been several months since I came on. You're actually my uh, my second ever YouTube appearance as a secular brownie S uh, several months ago, and then I decided to just go all full on and start a YouTube channel shortly after um, my engagement with you guys. Um, so obviously, thank you for that. Thank you for that several months ago, and thank you for today. Yeah, the skeptic uh, is bum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and obviously, you know, I just wanted to take a quick minute to kind of commend the growth of your channel and uh, the growth of your fan base, and obviously your dedication to like the truth. So you uh, you have different uh, spectrums. You have you you can have Christy Winters in one session. You can have Blair White in the other. You know, but you can still kind of meet them halfway, which is very uh unique but anyways uh can you repeat your question sorry i kind of got lost in uh kissing your ass a little bit <laughs> yeah no, no worries um well, what are your thoughts on um how one can criticize feminism without falling into the the whole anti-feminist movement the, the problem with the term anti-feminist is it depends on how you define feminist a feminist is someone who believes in gender equality I think by default, most people are feminists, even if they don't follow fall into the feminist tribalism. Neither do I. You may, but I'm I don't fall into the feminist tribalism. But it, it, by definition, I I would count myself as a, as a feminist. But if you're an anti-feminist, that that would mean that you're anti whatever that word means. But what what these people what what anti-feminism intends to do? Because I'm 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 in touch with you know, the anti-feminism crowd as well. I think a lot of my viewers are part of the anti-feminism crowd. Uh, when people are anti-feminist, they're anti-feminist tribalism, anti-feminist extremism. Um, so there's a difference between looking out for women, or, and men, of course, as well, uh, who are, are victims of domestic violence and assault and so on and so forth, uh, versus uh, kind of um, seeking minuscule forms of sexism wherever you see it like the olympics or something you know so so i think i think the anti-feminism crowd is obviously against people like vox or whatever who are in the in the, in the latter end of it where it's a it's an individual a, a young girl who's like has a youtube channel and she 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 basically starts off from a standpoint that everything is sexist and everything is misogynistic and she looks for it everywhere she goes so like on candid and uh ja what's her name Jacqueline Glenn a fellow youtuber um, she she was pr she was promoting candid because of advertising or whatever and she read a post on the candid app which is an anonymous confession app and someone wrote I hate when people say they like when guys say they like me for my personality that's so sexist you should look for my intelligence but you know like the anti-feminism crowd is against people like that who look for sexism wherever they go but the problem with the term anti-feminism is what I said earlier. It's like it implies different things, and that's where a clash between people who are genuinely into gender equality, uh, gender equality movements, like you know, in in the Arab world and so on and so forth, like feminisms that are required there. Uh, there's a clash between that and what we're seeing now. Like recently, there's there's been a slow movement. Like during my hibernation period, there's been a slow movement starting out in the Twitter world, at least in my circles, of against uh, the male guardianship in Saudi Arabia. Have you? seen this yes and yes. and uh one of my um 
one of my uh, friends, you can say her her Twitter handle is D D Misfit, and her uh, you her name is Haram Girl or something. Or her Twitter yeah, we'll name. Yeah, her on this channel. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yep. so someone wrote to her like because this this individual that tweeted to her, he was so anti-feminist that he's anti anything feminist. So he says he he wrote a quote. He wrote, "Woman, woman says, hey, honey, I want to go out for a little bit." And the husband says, wait, what? No. The woman screams, misogyny. So he's basically calling her challenges of the of real patriarchy. I mean, this is this is not the, the, the conspiracy theory that Western feminists kind of conjure up where they look for it everywhere. I'm talking about a genuinely misogynistic society like Saudi Arabia that requires real, like even first wave feminism is required there to an extent. They haven't even reached their first wave. We're already in our third. Um, this guy is so anti-feminist. He's anti that, you know, anti anti that movement, and that, that's that's the kind of a concern that I've been having with overtly anti-feminism movements. Yeah, and that's that kind of brings me back to to your point where you said that, um, that there's a certain tribalism in feminism. That's obviously true. Um, do you think that? that is inherent to just being as part of a group. So obviously we're talking about anti-feminism here. Uh, clearly somebody that far gone uh, on the anti-feminist spectrum is uh, being very tribalistic. You know, it doesn't really yeah. matter what, uh, what a feminist does, what a feminist say, they're, they're always wrong. It doesn't matter if feminists petition, you know, to have um, parental leave for, for fathers. Hmm. Uh, if it's if it's a feminist idea, then it's got to be bad. It's got to be it's got to be anti-male, and that there's a violation of of men's rights and anti-feminism that I think is completely false. Um, and, and they add and they add a uh, they it's as if like you're so much you're so far into a tribalism that you you add an inherent stigma in the word um, uh, you in the word feminism. You know you you stigmatize it. Then anybody who call then any male feminist like yourself who calls himself a feminist, they call they're called cucks. Like wh I've been questioning recently, like what is this? Like how come? What? It, how, why is it that if a man is a progressive or a feminist, he's automatically called a, a, like a cuckold or something? I mean, I I do disagree with like Steve Shives. I disagree with his ideas. I I, I sometimes find him condescending. But I'm not gonna go out of my way to call him a cuck everywhere I see him. You know, I I, I want to kind of engage his ideas because. I, th I think people tend to come from, uh, I don't know if you've seen this TED talk by Jonathan Haidt, where he's talking about like uh, uh, kind of ideological tribalism. He's saying that people generally want good, right? People people start, people start come from a good place. So even anti-feminists, they don't come from a place of, I want to put women down. I don't think they, they want to. They just, they just come from a place where they see the feminist tribalism as a form of fascism. But because people, everybody comes from a good place, or not everybody, or most people come from a good place with their ideologies and such, from Islam to Islamism to feminism or liberalism, whatever you want to call it. Um, but then they go so far into the tribalism that whatever is outside of their tribe, their ideological tribe, they see as inherently evil. And I, I've seen this because I come from a social justice like warrior background I used, I used to identify with that form of tribalism so obviously coming out of it i i'm able i criticize that but then i see even even within kind of people who i agree with as well and who agree with me it's not that i'm, I'm calling their ideas bad i'm just saying that they create a kind of a an army of sorts um like they, like this tribe of sorts that anybody who kind of comes out as a feminist they, they they're, they're they kind of um, it's, it turns into personal attacks, the same personal attacks that they that they accuse feminists of, like calling males like cucks or something, or something weird like that, or 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 just disregarding anything with the label feminism, uh, just because it's. I mean, I I don't like I I personally don't, this is not me coming out as a feminist. I, I I'm I expanded that identity or that label to egalitarian, which I think we all more or less are, but. I, I don't think that feminism necessarily has to equal evil, or as Milo would say, has to equal cancer. You know, <laughs> hashtag Milo is cancer. <laughs> um, well, I think I think that's that's all very good points and tribalism. I, I think it's called identity politics on the yeah. on the left, um, and I mean yeah. this is something that is endemic to right wing ideology and that whole religious political religious uh, motivation that, that is Islamism, for instance, or uh, any other religion you, you care to name that has political influence. 
it, it's all about tribalism. It's all about the in out, in group out group uh, mentality. And it's uh, amazing to me that anti feminists, people who proudly proclaim themselves anti women's rights group, think that they are somehow above that mentality because they criticize one such mentality in feminism. And it's I, I think the biggest. Um, Obviously, on this channel, we criticize fellow feminists. You know, we police our own, that kind of thing. And uh, um, you know, we've had we've had many disagreements with fellow feminists, and that doesn't mean that they're not feminists. You know, it just means that they're um, that we share different ideas. Um, maybe uh, they or we are worse at being feminist than some other people, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not feminists or they're not feminist. And. Who is it? I, I gotta, I gotta meet for a second. There's a train coming. God damn it! Yeah, tra the train thing happened last time too. <laughs> you should probably move to a non-train area. <laughs> well, it's okay. Commutes are at least convenient. Yeah, right. Um, so, <laughs> as I was saying, I think the most important thing is if I had to like label a enemy for feminism, I, I would say that it is people who identify with feminism, who call themselves feminists, who don't live up to the name. And th this is not a no true Scotsman. I don't think people really understand what a no true Scotsman is. Like if, if you don't match the definition of whatever label you're identifying with, that's not a no true Scotsman fallacy. That's just you failing to identify correctly. So somebody who says that they're for social justice, for instance, and then they call for like, segregation you know like black only spaces or something that they're not really for social justice like that's very regressive that's very right wing they just have like a liberal coat of paint on it as i said in my new video uh in my latest video and i think that those kind of feminists are i think they're they're the anti-feminist's best friend because they're, they're like the trope that just won't stop giving and You're basically talking about extremes on any ideological spectrum. Yes. Like, like, like it's one thing to to want to challenge police brutality in, in black or lower income neighborhoods. It's another to call for genocide of police or white people or the suburbs or anything like that. I mean, they're, they're, they're two very different things. They're like, it's one thing to kind of uh, be concerned about the police shootings, like shootings of police, of victimizing police officers. It's another thing to completely go on the Blue Lives Matter bandwagon and consider any kind of black, uh, pro-black movement kind of regressive. I mean, it's, it's just such, it's just such extreme. It's like, you know, it's one thing to be like, like, you know, a, 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 you know, just a regular Muslim, you just do your own thing, you just practice. And obviously Islamists, you want to actively impose it on other people. Sitting with ex-Muslims, like, you know, you can criticize Islam, right? You're critical of it, yeah, sure. But then to completely go on the way end of the spectrum where you want to demonize all Muslims and, Islam completely. I mean, it's, it's just such extreme. It's it's extremism of any sorts. That's like the the bane of society. I mean, throughout history, we've seen it. Extremism of any sort, like fascism or Nazism, and feminist extremism, which is what we're seeing now. Like feminists that I like to identify with are is people like Christina Hoff Summers because she lives in women's rights and she'll kind of do her own little fact checking of you know feminist myths or feminist truths and so on and so forth. And I really kind of appreciate. Um, that's a really cute dog, by the way. Uh, I really appreciate. I really, I really do appreciate like fact people who do genuine fact checking. But for someone to kind of call anybody under a given label like uh, evil or stupid or whatever, you know, it's 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 not helpful in a sense. It's, I mean, maybe maybe I'm too PC and diplomatic. Maybe I'm too PC or diplomatic for like the YouTube world. But it it doesn't seem very helpful if you at least want to engage in meaningful dialogue. Of course, some of our viewers will be like, yeah, so what? Who cares about meaningful dialogue? We're right, they're wrong. But, you know, nobody is ever always right. Even I may be wrong, you may be wrong in some things. You just have to admit you're wrong and yeah, continue. Of course. Yeah, I, I think that's that's another part of the, like, human condition that it, that is endemic to all of these, these in-group, out-group tribes is, like, a, a an unwillingness to admit when when you have wrong information. There's nothing wrong necessarily with being ignorant unless you're willfully ignorant. And so when presented with information, it's up to you to educate yourself. Yeah. And and you know, if it doesn't jive with your version of reality, too bad. You need you need to change your opinions. As we have many times on this channel. 
through our discourse with anti-feminists and a great many of them seriously have stopped calling themselves anti-feminists because they see the the, the reason behind our uh, enmity towards such a broad generalization just being anti something it's such a it's a very radical statement and in terms of no I'm not I'm not sure which feminists specifically you're talking about as far as the extremists that you're seeing now but I, I know that there's always been extremists uh, within the feminist movement within the left uh, generally and um, that kind of I think it's it's, it's that whole horseshoe thing where it's uh, the people in the middle have a lot more in, in common no matter where they lean than uh, the, the people up up in the uh, corners. The yeah. extremists on the left and the extremists on the right. They have more in common with each other than they do with the centrists. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think like 99% of the time, the best solution is usually found in the middle somewhere um, where yeah. you you hear both sides of an argument and like, like you said, nobody's ever like 100% wrong or very rarely. Uh, so you can take the best ideas from, from all sides, you know, and that's, that's perfectly fine. You know, just because somebody is like a fiscal conservative doesn't mean that they're going to be like wrong on, on social liberal issues, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, and it, it, it's one of the concerning things I find about the Rubin report. Um, the Rubin report started off very centrist and, in, in, in several months ago, he would bring on all sides of the spectrum. He'd bring on Larry Elder and Steven Crowder and Ben Shapiro, who are obviously right-wing people, but he'd also bring on people who kind of lean more towards the center, like Sam Harris. He'd bring on, um, obviously, a little bit more people from the right than the left, but there would be much more balance several months ago, Gary Johnson. But now I, I feel Rose like... Barr. Huh? Roseanne Barr. Oh, yeah. He even brought on Christina Hoff Summers. I mean, he brought on Sarah Hayter. He brought on a lot of like great, uh, great intellectuals in the beginning, but now like I feel like um, you know he he has a he's a specialization which is criticizing leftism or criticizing the quote uh, you know the regressive left, uh, SJWs. Nothing wrong with that. I'm critical of of those notions as well, uh, but I I feel like um, I, I expect more from his show in a sense that he presents himself as good ideas, bad ideas, you know, free speech, all speech is welcome. Um, I personally, I think I've tweeted him several times. I think he should have someone on who identifies as something he completely disagrees with, like SJW feminism. He should have someone on to talk about their point of view. Um, you know, or you know, so, so, someone, that, someone that he completely disagrees with or his crowd disagrees with, at least they can make their case and, and kind of bring people you know, show people, okay, look, you know, my, my opinion isn't completely correct, but it's not completely incorrect as well. There's some goods, like there's some goods of feminism, there's some bads of feminism. Okay, here's the goods. Take the goods of every little ideological, you know, solution or whatever. Um, but no, he kind of focus. he just focuses on like, you know, campus politics, um, yeah. regressive left. He, 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 he kind of began to focus on that and, um, it's quite concerning. I mean, I think moving forward, he should definitely bring on more leftists. He should bring on more people that he identifies as the regressive left to come on and defend Islam so he can provide his criticisms of it. Um, so his his crowd, his audience would at least, you know, see more conflict of opinion, which is what he advocates. He advocates conflict of opinion on yes. his show. He advocates that, but he, he usually doesn't conflict with his... Uh, interviewees opinions he usually just say like he he'll, he'll bring on like sam harris one day who is like an atheist and he's i, I identify him as like a libertarian atheist type you know like uh he's not anti-gay he's you know he's just everybody do, do their own thing and he'll bring on ben shapiro the next day who'll call homosexuality immoral and filthy and impure um and Ben Shapiro is entitled to his opinion. I'm not calling him evil person for that. I know it comes from his religious convictions. But Dave Rubin, as a, a, someone who's gay, he should challenge him on that. Be like, no, why is that impure? Because that, at least in my opinion, that's bad speech. He's he, it's free speech. It's still bad speech. And Dave Rubin should challenge him with better speech, with good speech. Exactly. And, and, you know, this, this whole free speech thing, it doesn't mean that you just shut the fuck up and let everybody talk. It means you, you, you hear what they have to say. But you should challenge their bad ideas. That's what yeah. free speech. That's what makes free speech work. If you just let everybody fucking talk garbage, 
then there's going to be a whole lot of trash floating around, you know? And, and so like you were saying, he could still hold to his whole free speech thing, but challenge Ben Shapiro be like, can you elaborate on that? Why, why do you think that? Give you some examples. Why, you know? And he doesn't. He doesn't challenge his fucking guests at all. I, and I, th- I think he will only have right wingers. Like he'll have some leftists on every once in a while. But it, it, and he's really obsessed with like um, uh, criticizing the regressive left, which he's kind of bastardized. It's kind of like become the the new racist or sexist. It's just like a like a fucking slur that he throws out, which is really offensive to me because I think that Majid Nawaz's definition of regressive left was was spot on. As as again in the last video. And uh, it was very useful, but he just kind of fucking tossing it around left and right now. And it's, 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 it's unfortunate. And most of the people who agree with him on that are going to be right wing. So he just has like this instant bias where with the kind of guests that he likes to have on. And then he doesn't challenge them. Like he, no. it, he was a liberal who just had only right wing guests on, but he challenged them, but he doesn't, he just gives them a platform. So you might as well just go watch their channel or whatever, or their show instead of watching them on the fucking Dave Rubin show. Cause he never questions them. And that's, that's one thing I like about Steven Crowder's show. I mean, I, I agree with him on a lot of things. I agree with him. I disagree with him on a lot of things as well, but he presents his case. He presents his opinions. He provides evidence. He'll also bring on a leftist to defend their point of view and they'll present their case and the audience kind of decides. Obviously his viewers are mostly like conservative, so they'll kind of lean towards his direction, but at least they see, like recently hit a Black Lives Matter debate or something like that. And uh, at least the audience got to see the other side, you know? instead of a monologue and he and Stephen Carter would push them on it like okay but in that case that's also free speech you know the 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 opponent or the guest would come in would have their free speech and Crowder would respond with his own free speech and the audience decides okay which is the better view I want to adopt but Ruben kind of just lets them talk like like um like it, I remember there's a moment in the Ben Shapiro uh, interview where he was like, okay, okay, okay. My audience says I don't challenge my guests enough, so let's find something good to agree on. What about gay marriage? And Ben Shapiro said, well, I don't really care. It's uh, it sh- This shouldn't be an, a social issue because it should be up to the individual or the state. Um, and, you know, the churches decide. I personally think it's immoral and impure, so I wouldn't promote it in my family. And that's when I think Ruben, he found an agreement saying, okay, let each person decide who they want to marry. But he should have called him out and, okay, why is it impure? Why is it immoral? You didn't have to call him a homophobe. You didn't have to call him a homophobe or slur names, but at least be like, okay, no, it's not impure. It's just love or it's, you know, talk about some kind of science thing. But sometimes I'm I'm, I'm convinced that he doesn't have a lot of substance of his own. Um, Because uh, when Steven Crowder interviewed him, and Stephen Carter pushed him on gay marriage. He didn't have a lot of like points to defend himself. Kind of a very general libertarian argument where it's like, oh, just let, leave them alone. It doesn't really hurt anybody. But you know, he, it's it when you when you push him on substance, it's it's really hard to get anything of substance out of him. So he's he's good at he's good at asking leading questions, and I think he's he's great at asking questions. But when he's put in the spot, or when he has to debate, I think. You know, uh, I think that's where he kind of... And that's only half of how you do an interview. Like, you have to have yeah. some kind of pushback. You have to be able to not just ask leading questions that allow the person to continue monologuing for an hour and a half, but to also then be like, okay, so stop right there. Point number one, let's elaborate on that. What do you mean by that? Even if it's an issue yeah. that you completely, like, loathe the person for having that opinion, like, you can still have a conversation with them about it or not, but... To just let them talk, I mean, it's, it's it's like pointless. Like, wh- why are you even doing this show if you're not going to provide anything? Yeah. It, so I, I mean, I just want to let the audience know. I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not a hater of Dave Room. Actually, I still enjoy his show. I, this is just more or less feedback from me and socially awkward. Because we people. because we see the potential <laughs> of his show, and we we probably liked his earlier episodes and. Uh, you know that that's because we like what he what he does, or at least what he did. That, that we have a strong opinion. Yeah. I know, and I, I would, I, I think, I think he should, uh, you know, move forward, uh, move forward. You know, considering these feedback, I mean, th- there's not much change he really needs to make. Uh, the only two changes are bring on more leftists because there's two ends, of, or there's multiple ends of an opinion. Um, 
and give more pushback. Don't just let a climate change denier come on and deny climate change because then your viewers will hear this monologue. If this is the only video of yours that they've seen, they'll go on denying climate change and you'll hurt the environmental risk caused. At least give him some pushback and show him or show him or her, your guest, a climate change denier that, hey, look, you know, there's all this scientific evidence behind climate change. So your viewers can at least see, oh, look, there's all this evidence and this guy's denying it. Well, and what's, what's worse is that he, he then says things like, uh, all, all these guests have my stamp of approval. Like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> How can you call yourself a liberal when you have mostly right-wing people on, but then you say shit like that? They have your stamp of approval. Like, okay, yeah, you found regressive left that you agree on. I'm sure right-wingers are happy to shit on the regressive left with you. That You're literally just becoming another right-wing ideologue. You're just, you're just I know. You're a little fucking platform under the guise of like libertarian values or some shit. <laughs> but yeah, like you know, enough of a uh, Dave Rubin. Like, how how has uh, how, I mean, since we last um, spoke, how has your journey as a as a YouTuber or like an ideologue, I'd like to call you, come along? Okay, uh, well, I, I think it's been it's been incredible. Uh, actually, we've we've had so much love and support from the community. It's it's been absolutely just breathtaking. Uh, it, Harley has been having trouble with her family, as, as many of you know, and and the YouTube community has come forward as whether they're feminists or not, uh, even anti-feminists, even openly anti-feminist people have come forward to support her and us, and and they've been more of a family to to TSF than 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 any biological people have. So that really speaks to the whole. Uh, you know, nurture versus nature thing, I, maybe. Uh, you know, you can choose who your family is. Blood is, is not all that thick after all. And, uh, you know, this this is always an opinion that I had, but uh, it's one that, that took Harley some time to come around to, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have imagined that the support would be as it is. Um, you know, we, we mostly just, just anticipated a lot of... Uh, anti-feminist hate when we first started this channel and, uh, and we, we got our first share of that but uh, the people who are interested in conversation who are interested in uh, expanding their own understanding of issues have been very receptive to uh, our channel and the fact that we change our positions as well and so together as a community we, we really have been growing and that is, I mean, we, we, you know, we're still a tiny channel by comparison to like most anybody else, but um, the amount of the fans that we do have, we wouldn't trade them for anyone. Like they're, they're fantastic people. They're, they're real friends. They're real comrades. Uh, even if they sit on the opposite end of an aisle on a given issue, uh, we, we tend to find a lot in common nevertheless. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, uh, openly changing your views is a good. Thing. I think, I think, um, I had to take a break for a while just because I wanted to kind of recollect my, my thoughts instead of get caught in the rush of YouTubing and all the people saying something and then responding and then responding back and just that rush, you know, because I think, I think it's come to a point where in YouTube, it's come to a point where let's say you say uh, the uh, capitalism is awesome and I think capitalism is awful. So I'm going to rush to create a video that to say capitalism is awful just for the sake of responding. And I'm just going to say stuff. Uh, and most of the time, in most cases, they, they don't provide a lot of evidence. They kind of just say stuff and go on a monologue and you'll respond to me saying, Oh no, capitalism is awesome. You, uh, you SJW leftist, you communist, uh, <laughs> stop being such a communist. And I'll be like, Oh yeah, well, you know, you're like, I don't know like a uh, imperialist, I would we'll kind of just go back and forth instead of uh, doing actual research. And meanwhile, our fans create tribalisms behind us, kind of their little teams behind, or not me and you, but the two opposing views and, and the comment sections kind of reflect that kind of, uh, I completely agree with you. You're awesome. Thanks for bashing that guy. Or, oh my God, how dare you criticize him? You liberal cuck or something like that, you know? Um, so like I had to take a break from YouTube and blogging just because of that, just because I wanted to kind of recollect my thoughts and decide, okay, what I want to present, it has to be true. It has to be 
fair. You know, it has to be factual. It can't just be off of a whim. Because uh, I think I almost got sucked into that. Uh, not I didn't, but I almost did. But, you know, uh, there was a little phase some of our friends have had about doxing like a month ago or two months ago, just debating about doxing or child porn four months ago. Do you remember that? Child porn? Yeah, like, Amos, what, Amos I, I know. Like, like, why is that even up for discussion? Like, why would why is child porn... A debate, and then I'm like, what? libertarianism apparently, and, and see, th this is the, another thing. Libertarians have their own extremists, where where they're just like, oh, this is an opportunity to satisfy my child porn fetish. I'm gonna say it's libertarian. Like, what the fuck? Well, I I think in Amos Yee's case, um, he's a very young guy, and he has a lot of popularity for a seventeen community. years old, and he advocates for baby rape. Like yeah. openly, just, just like no babies can consent to rape or to sex, so he doesn't call it rape. It's it's babies. I, I, I think like kind of explaining, explaining like he's he's seventeen years old. He I mean in, in person he's not. People in Singapore don't like him very much. He, there's videos of him getting bullied and beat up at malls and stuff. Uh, but on the internet, because of his vulgarity, he he's gained a lot of popularity. So he figured. So I think he. His 70 year old mind sees someone like Christopher Hitchens saying crazy things and, you know, kind of coming out as a contrarian society. I think that's what he wants to become. So he found he found his own controversial opinion, which is child porn should be legal. So he went on to kind of research it. And uh, it's all about like kind of debating with taking a strong stance and being popular for that strong stance. Because previously he humped the Quran. I think that was great. I mean, I think it's offensive, but it's, 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 it's it's important that people have that freedom of expression to be able to hump a Quran or a Bible or rip a Quran and whatever, you know, like criticize it or whatever. Um, I mean, they're all free speech, even child porn advocacy is free speech as well. Uh, but I think I think he took the next step to be like, okay, well, how much more vulgar can I be? Everybody's already atheist. Criticizing Islam is becoming a popular thing now. Okay, what more? So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of in its own sense, trying to get attention, and then he kind of flashed onto anarcho-capitalism. So he's kind of going to an extreme end of a given ideology, which is libertarianism, and he's changing his libertarianism to anarchism, full-on anarchism. Do whatever the hell you want. There should be no state at all. Um, so, but, and, and that's something else going on in the YouTube scene several months ago. Like, why are people entertaining a child porn discussion? And then I saw, like, the crowd, and it's just all these response statement response response to response response to the response of the response and it just goes back and forth back and forth right yeah the, the the response format on youtube um so we make response videos to people who we can't get on the show um other than that we tend to just have them on a chat i think the only exception to that was jenny mcdermott i, hmm. I, I don't think we asked her for for a chat we just did a reply video to a single video that she did um, other than that, I, I think everyone else that we did reply videos to or, or just we haven't had on the show yet. Yeah. Uh, that will be like that. That is how we use that format of, so, of video responding. Yeah. So, so tomorrow you guys are going to have Amal on. That's right. Amal, I mean, yeah, so Amal, Amal's coming back tomorrow. We're going to we're going to have her on to talk about uh, presumably do a little bit more Quranic study or well, really whatever she wants to talk about. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I know you guys wanted me on that, but I are all just three of us. The schedules kind of don't match. But like, yeah. what are what are some of the things that I think you like? I'm asking. Well, what are some things you wanted three of us to discuss that we can, that I can go over with with you here? Well, I, I think what she it, she wanted to have you on uh, with her in order to have like a um, more diverse back and forth, just for the. Uh, I, I don't know what exactly she may disagree with you on, but just for the fact that you are also an ex-Muslim and you are male as opposed to her, uh, you would provide a different perspective. So yeah. I think that, that that would be a valuable discussion, um, most definitely. But it'll have to suffice now as uh, two separate videos. Oh, okay. Well, I may, maybe we can do something next week. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah but, the... sure. Uh, if, if all our schedules line up, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pretty flexible at the moment, but um, I think you wanted to talk about the burkini a little bit. Is that right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, okay, so if, if someone wants to wear a piece of cloth to a beach, 
no matter what it, no matter what the cloth can mean, even if the cloth is like a Nazi sign or whatever, uh, like it's just their own freedom. Like they should be able to do. It. I don't. I don't think the police should come off and make her strip her clothes just because her clothing does not agree or comply with the French values. You're kind of imposing your your local values on like a minority, and it's it's it, then it's very different from Saudi Arabia where a foreign woman comes in and she has to cover. It, it's sorry, not very different. It's very similar. The, the, the conceptually they're very similar things. Um, I, the, I think the burkini as a symbol, I think the values behind it are atrocious. I think it's in, extremely misogynistic. And I know, I understand where it comes from because growing up, I would see a lot of uh, women relatives of mine. Uh, they they can't, well, they couldn't wear bikinis because it would show too much skin. So they had a hard time going to swimming pools. They'd have to go wear their regular clothes and pajamas and whatever. Um, so burkini kind of accommodates that value of uh, a woman who wants to cover, but be in water at the same time. But I think yeah. I think that the fact that a woman needs to cover before going to water or while going to water or the woman can't wear the bikini if she, if she wants to, if she wants to, um, or, or not even bikini, just cover a little bit less, maybe even sw swimming trunks or something. I think that alone is problematic. Uh, you know, like, burkini responds to a very, like, in my opinion, a misogynistic value. But just because people have these misogynistic values doesn't mean that we should police the outcome of the misogynistic values. Uh, it, the outcome isn't violent. It's just a piece of clothing. So we shouldn't yeah. police someone's clothing. But I think just as the women should be allowed to wear the burkini, we should be allowed to criticize the burkini and allow the individual uh, Muslim woman to have the agency decide for herself, okay, do I want to cover up or do I not want to cover up? I listen to Skeptic Feminist and Amal the Apostate talk about like the hijab and burkinis and burqas or whatever, but I also listen to my local imam who has the better ideas. And then she decides for herself. And in most cases, sure, they'll go with faith in God, um, but like, at least, at least they'll have. At least there's a free market of ideas in that sense. Well, I mean, ostensibly there is. Like, it, it, she may have the option to to make that choice. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like um, but, in but, some cases, they, they won't be allowed to to leave the fucking house unless they're wearing something appropriate. So a burkini yeah. could be her only way to go to the beach, and yeah. this is something that needs to be taken into account when you're when you're criticizing the clothing. You need to criticize the culture, not the person subjected to it. I think is the yeah. major dis major distinction. But also, so like, obviously, we're, we're against the burqa and and all these wearing rape culture on your face bullshit. But um, at the same time, we understand that some people just don't have the fucking option to not participate in it, and we're not going to hold them accountable for being victims of that culture. Yeah, but also like also like you know. Um the government shouldn't police the outcome because if, if there's a burkini ban, let's say, uh, then a woman, a Muslim woman who is under restrictions is not allowed to go to the beach at all. The, the burkini was her one way to go to the beach and get wet. Now she can't do that at all. Like, so it's same thing taking away the burqa. Then they become, you know, housed in. So as an alternative, there should be obviously what I said earlier, the free market of criticisms and ideas, but that's, that's, that's not where it ends. Because, for example, for social work of domestic violence, uh, for domestic violence survivors to begin, there had to be criticism of domestic violence to begin with. Because I, as you remember, the history of feminism, domestic violence used to be advertised, you know, like tools on spanking your wife if she misbehaves uh, were sold and advertised and in the United States in the, in the 1920s. Um, but it, for us to kind of move past that, we have to criticize domestic violence first, as movement at the start. So obviously criticism of the values are, is where it starts, but it continues through the criticism leading to uh, practical action, which is not government policing people wearing a certain clothing, because some women do choose to wear burqa. Yep. Um, we shouldn't police them. We can criticize their decision or the values behind the burqa, but not we shouldn't take their burqa off, but other women don't choose and they should be, they should kind of have uh, connections to social work organizations and that's what we should be promoting. Um, kind of not policing, but more a support mechanism in, for those who want to support mechanism. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And, and in fact, um, I, I think it's, it, it was in fact a very detrimental what the police did um, in that case. It was, if you were, if it is a situation where she has the option, um, then they lost the war of ideas right there, because they basically just substituted one form of telling her what to do with another. Yeah. And 
I mean, why not stick with the devil you know, right, kind of thing. So I, I think that was a, a real blow for liberal values. And um, it really did not advertise Western values very well at all. And uh, I think that's what we need to be doing is showing how secular morality or morals arrived from a secular humanist perspective are far superior to anything any religion has to offer. Yeah. And um, we can't do that if we're enforcing it at the point of you know police officers stripping women on the fucking beach. <sighs> yeah. It's it's like like I used to work in um, I used to do social work for domestic violence victims um, uh, from Asian backgrounds and there obviously there would be women who would actively seek or their family members would actively seek out the resources for them there would be other women who would come to us for consultation we provide them consultation on what they can do how can they can they can move forward but they go back to the abuser they they want to stay remain within the abuser oh. Looks like we lost him. Damn. Um, we'll give it a few minutes and uh, see if he manages to hop back in. Otherwise, uh, we've already been going for 50 minutes, so it's uh, you know it's it's been a good chat. I think we, we we got a lot we got a lot hashed out in a very short time. There he is. Hello, hello, hello. Sorry, yeah. I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know what just happened. Um, but there, there would be uh, women who would seek the resources uh, of, you know, domestic violence, social work. There'd be women who don't seek it, who who want to remain within the abuser's household for whatever reason. I mean, they have their usually ro romance and dependence, but um, but even even when we provide them like or help to find means to financial dependence, they they're emotionally attached to that. So even then, there then and there, the women, the individual women. Cho chose the the resources that she wants to utilize. We can't force her go into her house, evict her out of her husband's uh, environment, just because uh, we feel like you know, like we, I mean, unless it was an extreme situation where he's about to kill her. But uh, but it's like it's she also has to make the individual choice to get to try to get out of that. You know, it's, it's and, too. And, and that's 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 really that's extremely tricky because j just because well, first of all, police can can in fact detain people when there's a domestic violence uh, dispute, uh, whether the whether the woman or the man called or the neighbors. Um, yeah. So I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the, is the adult woman, after all the consultation, choosing to remain within the household. Right. You know? Yeah, there, there's really, there, unfortunately, there's nothing that, that we can really do aside from imposing some kind of dictatorial totalitarian solution to it. Um, yeah. So it, it is very unfortunate that people become damaged in such a way that they become dependent on those who hurt them. But it is very, very understandable from a human psychological and brainwashing point of view why that happens. It's just breaking that cycle is way harder than, than just knocking on the door and saying, oh, you know, come to the shelter, you'll be fine. It, it's, it's not yeah. that easy for, for people in a psychological so, so, so. So, so the question in a, a domestic violence case or even a religious repression case is kind of breaking the brainwash, breaking, you know, kind of, yeah, exactly, breaking the brainwash system, kind of promoting more and more programs and education and things like that, awareness campaigns or whatever, of how to, that, that kind of try to get people who go through the repression away from uh, what they're brainwashed into, you know. Um, so like that that's something to consider instead of just the police coming in and uh, trying to remove uh the woman uh the woman goes back after the police activity is done she just goes back to that same household is okay how do we keep her from going back to that household and same thing with the the bur the burkini woman who was stripped by the police you know what is is she going to stop wearing the burqa and the hijab or the burkini whatever no especially now that the laws of around the burkini has been changed so like her her internal values we're still the same. It's just now that the police got involved, they kind of forced her to take it off and um, take her, forced her to. It, it, it may very well have galvanized her and her community more strongly against uh, the secular government. And what bothers me is people who are against the burkini ban. Um, they they're the same people who fail to criticize burqa impositions in like yeah. you know Muslim environments in Muslim countries. I mean that's such a. Two-way street. I, th I think uh, 
and go, segueing into another topic, which is leftism, is that leftists are so, they, they can be so obsessed with criticizing the establishment and Western establishment and colonization and imperialism yeah. is that they, they focus on this where of the, of the Western, you know, French institution, uh, quote unquote, oppressing religious minority instead of um, focusing on, uh, you know, oppression created by people who aren't from the West, you know, um, on the, their women or gays or whatever. They, it's, it's, a, it's such a double standard that these people, they, they, they're, they're very quick to jump on criticizing the French government and the West. And rightfully so, I think the French police messed up in this case. But when it comes to, you know, a burqa, man, a mandated burqa or niqab in Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, or honor culture in Pakistan or slut shaming all over there, everywhere you go there for showing your hands or whatever, um, they, they stay silent. They say it's their culture. So then what? Can we just say it's the French culture and, you know, stay silent? No, we criticize the French culture. We criticize the French values that forces someone to be quote unquote free, just as we should criticize the Saudi Arabian government for forcing people to, for forcing women to cover up or else they're sluts. Absolutely. You know, like, it has to go both ways. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, and it goes with what we were saying earlier, the ideological tribalism, it's always one or the other. So like people who criticize the Saudi government, some people, they criticize the Saudis and the Muslims for the covering and all that. They, they gave the Burkini a, a pass. They gave it the pass. They're like, oh, okay, it's okay. She's oppressed. And others who criticize the French, they give the Saudis a pass. They give the Iranians a pass. They give Islam a pass. It's like, no, they're both wrong in these cases. I mean, just let the individual woman choose. Let the woman choose. Is it that hard? Just let her choose what she wants to wear. If she wants to wear a hijab, you and I can criticize it. But by all means, she can wear the hijab if she wants to. If she doesn't want to wear a hijab, Muslim preachers can criticize it. But by all means, she doesn't want to wear the hijab. Just let her choose. Right. Uh, uh, the, the problem really does arise when either the imams or in this case, the police force the issue and uh, force people to conform or indeed her husband or whatever. Um, I mean, maybe she lives in a very progressive home. Who knows? But uh, I think you're, you're absolutely spot on. It is, I think, a type of bigotry from uh, ostensibly liberals who fail to criticize, quote-unquote, other cultures. They're not holding the other cultures up to account for... No, and I, I, feel, I feel offended because then I, as, as a brown man, I'm not held to the same um, it's, it's, moral it's standards the of the white man. Expectations. That's what Majid Nawaz called it, right? And, and I think, like, whereas the, the right-wingers tend to overlook any injustice within their own system but criticize other countries, the left tends to only focus on injustices within their own countries, which is very bigoted as well, if you think about it, because like, why don't you give a fuck about the other people? Like, they're just, let them do their own thing? What the shit, you don't think they deserve human rights? It's it's like during 9-11, uh, which was like several days ago, I saw a lot of my leftist friends post um, a, a meme, where, and I'm, I think I'm, I think I would create content on this, where it's, it's it shows, um, you know, a, a, a black slave from 200 years ago with whiplashes on his back. And it says, oh, when we see this, we say get over it. And then it shows a picture of Native Americans uh, getting oppressed or repressed. It says, when we see this, we say get over it. And then it's like, they show pictures of Twin Towers getting burnt. It's like, when we see this, we'll say we always remember. And people posting that, they also say, um, you know, I, I remember 9-11 and these assholes, which they showed the Bush administration, who exploited it for their own means. None of these memes ever condemned Islamism. They don't even talk about that. They don't talk about the people who got inside the planes, who made the individual decision to get inside the plane and crash into, like, skyscrapers. They, they, nobody... Well-educated Saudis, right? Well-educated Saudis, I mean, they, they come from a, a religious extremist ideology. Nobody talks about that and how that ideology still continues today. And there's a wave of attacks that came four months ago under a different president. I mean, it's not, we're not under President Bush and we're under President Obama. These are different presidents and prime ministers all around the world, and we still have the same issue. Nobody talks about this pinnacle of Islamism. But no, they just want to focus on Western imperialism. And I'm, I'm getting so fed up with this obsession with anti-establishment rhetoric. rhetoric. It's becoming like the cool thing to do now. It's like, oh, let me criticize the system because I want to criticize the man because that makes me seem like hip and rebellious. 
and and the thing is that this criticism of of Western governments, it's Western centric. Like they're the ones who always complain about how imperialist everybody supposedly is, and they're the ones who are obsessed with talking about only Western problems. No, no, the the West does not have it worse than the, any than, than other places. Okay, there are other places that also need attention, even if you don't have the physical power to do something about it. I mean, if you live in the U.S., you don't have any power about the French ban either. So, like, why would you have an opinion on that but not on women getting whipped in the fucking street for being raped or whatever in Pakistan? Come on. What the fuck? The, the, what kind of double the, standard is that? It's lazy. Yeah, it. And it's like, yeah. I guess it's just racism from the left. Yeah, it's bigotry of all. They're not real fucking liberals. Soft bigotry of uh, low expectations is what... I think we call it. It's like you're you're bigoted, but because you expect less from them. Um, there, there was a. Did you ever read um, like Majid Nawaz's uh, book? Yes, the the one that he did with Sam Harris. No, no, the one he did by himself, his own uh, life. Uh, no, I, I haven't read it. Radical. So he no, wrote I, like after after he got out of the Egyptian prison for being an Islamist in Egypt and spreading terrorism, um, he went back to the UK. And a lot of leftist news outlets would interview him. They'd, they'd be very happy and excited to interview him. So he wrote a he wrote a, a, a paragraph on this. He's like, "But so what? Oh, what is it? Hold on. Oh yeah, but so what? Why should I be the only one to admit his mistakes? Is not winning the war more important than truth?" This maxim I knew was also subscribed to some by some on the left, the regressive left. For them. Winning against capitalism was far more important than it was to their allies. I watched as our ideology Islamism, gained acceptance and we were granted airtime as Muslim political commentators. I watched as we were ignorantly pandered to by well-meaning liberals and ideologically driven leftists. How we Islamists laughed after at their naivete. And I'm just like, this is so true. It's like they, they give Islamists, or I don't, I've never seen them give Islamists an outlet, but I, I can imagine like they, they talk about Islamists like, oh, I understand it's because the West is so bad, but it's such a, it's such a paternal relationship with Islamists. It, it's, it, it's in its own sense, colonialist. It, it is, it is in a sense. It's, it's very like, oh, poor these guys, let's help them out against the, the big, you know, bad white man, you know, it's, it's, but then you don't give the Islamists any agency to decide for themselves that they want to take over the world and kill off the world dominating factor, which is the United States. They want to take over the United States. They they never give them the kind of agency in their ideology. They just either say nothing to do with religion, it's fault, and it's extremely condescending. Did you read ISIS's um recent uh, article? Yeah. In the beak, the the there are why we hate you. Yes, yes, Why? it's it's fantastic. Everyone should fucking read it. And by fantastic, I mean it's fucking terrifying because they know exactly what the left is doing, and they're fucking laughing their goddamn asses off. Yeah, they, they, I'm I'm gonna do a commentary on it, like maybe in a few days because I'm less busy now. But um, they 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 wrote like six bullet points, and four of the six were religious. Like, oh, you guys are filthy, morally. Uh, uh, morally degraded and all that stuff, and then and then the last two points were um, Western imperialism, and after that the next the next paragraph they wrote, okay, look, we know you guys like to blame it on Western foreign policy a whole lot and U.S. militaristic policy. We we mentioned those last and least because those are secondary purposes. Even if you did not fight us, we would focus on other local battles, but we would fight you eventually because we hate you. Your values negate our Islam. And I'm just like, Damn, it's also really cool. interesting how they, they, they sound just like all the other religious uh, people, at least the ones in the patriarchal monotheistic ones, uh, the, the Abrahamic religions, where they're like, yeah, we're, we're going to kill you, but it's for your own good. Ultimately, you know, we're, we're relieving you of your sin or whatever. They think they're doing the good thing. And, and that article is written so well. Like, it's got good graphics and everything. Uh, not a single it's got really good grammar. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's very professionally written. And <laughs> it's astounding, you know. Like, they're, they're just, they're, they're totally aware of what's going on. And they're just using it to their advantage. And yeah. They even talk about people like you and me. They're like, yeah, sure, there'll be there'll be people who 
uh, you know, recognize what we're doing and, and they're unequivocal in their condemnation of us. But, you know, nobody really listens to them. It's okay. It's true. And they're, they're completely correct, too. Like, nobody really... Cable news and the, the ones who matter, they don't really listen to us. So, so. Yeah. And when they do, they either call us racists or they use, you know, what we have to say to promote war. I mean, it's 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 such extreme. It's it's ridiculous. Well, to, to be honest, I am a raging racist. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if if someone is a hater of your content, they're gonna take that little quote, that little one second quote, and be like, "This guy said he's a racist." Black I also uh, I also fully support ISIS. Who is my rat? That's her name. Uh, yeah. So feel free to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, Stephen Crowder did that a bunch of times. Like he he would say things and he and he would give like a big pause and it sounded wrong. Like oh, I hate blacks, and then he would kind of or 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 get that fag out of here. And then it's and then and then you hear that word and you're like whoa it's messed up. But then they change the camera view and show someone smoking a cigarette and saying it's unhealthy. You know, so he he created a video of this recently where he said. Things that sound wrong, but then he added a context, and he's like, "Oh, let's see if this if YouTube bans this video, you know." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, th th somebody somebody mentioned in the comments. This is worth worth reading out. I think those who want to undermine the moral authority of Islam can incorporate feminist critique, as Christopher Hitchens did. So I, I think, and I mean, all you have to do is search Christopher Hitchens on our channel, and you will see exactly what they're talking about because. He, he was he was very much in line with with our views on a lot of things. He's but, so he's so like prescient in the sense that he predicted all a lot of things we discuss in this um, in this uh, uh, video in this episode. He he predicted so much of it. Like he predicted identity politics. He said, "Okay, look, you know, beware of identity politics." And this was a two thousand a book written in two thousand one. So. He's like, beware of identity politics. I'm seeing this in the left where people talk about how they feel and what they are instead of who they are and, you know, and how they feel instead of what ha what actually happened. So beware of that. I'm seeing a lot of that. I'm seeing a lot of people talking about, you know, different forms of identities like, you know, a Panamanian uh, transgendered woman will talk about being Panamanian transgendered instead of herself to individual. Beware of that. Don't get into that. And now look, it's... It's it's yeah. everywhere. It's ev yeah. everyone. Everyone's obsessed with what they are. I mean, people would look at you and be like, "Oh my God, this guy's a white European dude. He's Orientalist." I mean, it, it's ridiculous. It's it, they'll they'll not listen to what you're saying. They'll just see a white guy with a with a European accent talking about Islam. They'll be like, "Oh, okay, you're basically a colonizer, and you want to like you know, you're like the French police who took off the burkini." It's like, yeah, no. exactly. Exactly like, like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, and just and, because and, of the color of your skin and not your brain, you know. Right, and it's, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's dehumanizing, obviously, uh, no matter who you do that to, and it's, I, I, don't, I, don't, under, I don't understand it, like, it just, actually, I mean, the identity politics is too big of an issue to get into uh, so late in the game, but I did want to talk about one more thing before, yeah. we, uh, before we wrap it up, uh, really just to mention, is uh, one of the Christopher Hitchens videos that we mirrored, he predicted the... Fetish, fetishization of uh, the victim culture, right? Vict victim is, victims as fetishized. So, so yeah. like people want to be a victim. And he predicted that specifically as like a counter reaction to feminism from the men's rights. Yeah, yeah he said this in a 1994 discussion in Charlie Rose. That's right. And, I think you're talking uh, about the same one, right? I think I am. And, and yeah. he, I mean, obviously he was against um uh, circumcision and everything like that and he was he was very much yes, yes. as we are pro um pro the rights of men and boys um but he he warned against this whole victim culture where they're trying to like one up the feminists or whatever and uh like you said very prescient very, very much uh seeing into the future as far as as how events turned out yeah yeah. And on that note, I, I, I know you, uh, you you have to go. So, um, was there any final words that you wanted to say? Uh, well, thank you for having me on again, and uh, glad we found time. Uh, hopefully, uh, me, you, and your peers, and like, Skeptic Feminist, and Amal can do something together next week. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, and also, audience, uh, I'm, I'm going to volunteer Deadpool into uh, a panel discussion with Sophie Thomas sometime in the next upcoming weeks. So that should be interesting. You heard of Sophie Thomas, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So you guys, you get, you know, she does identify as a feminist, but you guys don't differ that much in views, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think you guys would have a fascinating discussion around the word feminism, and I would love to participate in that. Um, I'll go, have you guys on my channel in the upcoming weeks uh, about that. But um, yeah. but anyways, please, uh, uh, please, please, everyone, check out uh, the the Secular Brownies channel. Uh, he makes some wonderful content. Please subscribe oh. to him. Oh yeah, definitely check out my stuff. You know, I mean, it's nowhere near skeptic feminist stuff, but you know, I try, I try, I try to interject my thoughts or whatever. <laughs> Good no, things coming though. Modest, you know, like I am not modest at all, and that's why I'm so successful all the time in everything I ever do. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, you sound, you sound like Milo Yiannopoulos. <laughs> okay, before 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 that comparison is is. Yeah, a lot is allowed to sink in. Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Take care.